Sight, our most precious gift. Yet the eyes are one of the most sensitive and vulnerable parts of our body. Losing your eyesight would be a tragedy difficult to overcome. Yet many people take it for granted and ignore eye safety both on the job and off. 90,000 disabling eye injuries occur on the job every year. Nine out of 10 eye injuries are preventable. 80% of all eye injuries happened when the worker was not wearing safety glasses. Those injured while wearing safety glasses were not wearing the correct glasses for the hazard. In this program, we will discuss the areas in which eye injuries occur, the types of eye protection available, and proper procedures to follow when an eye injury happens. In the workplace, the most common cause of eye injuries are due to flying particles, chips of wood thrown off by a planing saw, fragments breaking off from a tool in use, or bits of metal thrown off by a grinder. A second common cause of eye injuries is working with hazardous chemicals. Chemicals sprayed or splashed into the eye can severely burn the eyes and cause irreparable damage. And solid caustic materials such as lye or lime cause even more dangerous burns than liquids. Even the fumes from some chemicals can damage unprotected eyes. Numerous eye injuries occur during welding operations, both from splatter or sparks that are thrown and damaging rays of light reaching the eyes. Many eye injuries happen off the job. 35,000 eye injuries occurred last year in home workshops and 30,000 during sports and recreational activities. All of these situations need to be respected. Remember, 90% of all eye injuries are avoidable. Don't take unnecessary chances. Wear your safety glasses. Make sure your safety glasses provide adequate protection against the particular hazard you are confronted with. The three main types of eye protection available are spectacles, goggles, and face shields. Spectacles, or glasses, are the most conventional type of eyewear. They protect against flying particles, dust, sparks, and glare. Their protection has been improved by including side shields and a brow bar. This protects from flying particles entering from the side or top. Goggles seal the entire eye area. When grinding, chipping, woodworking, and working with chemicals, goggles are the most effective. They fit snug to the face, sealing the eyes for complete protection. Goggles are available at a variety of styles. Some are constructed to be used with other equipment, such as a respirator. Splash goggles are used when working with chemicals because they completely seal the eye. Face shields provide full face and neck protection from flying particles, sparks, and chemical splashes. A face shield is not considered to be adequate protection by itself. Protective glasses or goggles must also be worn. With all eye protection, proper fit is important. The eyewear should provide protection against glare or fogging and have high impact resistance. It is most important to match the eyewear with the hazard you were confronted with. In addition to eye protection, engineering controls can be added to cut down certain hazards. Transparent safety barriers, known as static shielding, are effective for such stationary tools as high-speed grinders and cutters. These are not substitutes for eyewear, but enhancements. Workers should still wear safety glasses. Corrective eyeglasses may help your eyesight, but they are not protection enough in hazardous situations. OSHA regulations state that all persons who wear corrective eyeglasses must wear goggles over the corrective glasses or wear safety glasses that include corrective lenses. Eye injuries require immediate professional attention by a medical eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, Thorough examination and careful diagnosis are imperative in eye injury cases. For instance, in penetrating injuries, the foreign object can be difficult to detect and could be missed altogether by someone with no experience in such injuries. If an injury is caused by chemical burns, on-the-spot first aid is necessary even before seeing a doctor. Eye injuries from chemical burns should be immediately flushed with clear running water for at least 15 minutes. In this program, we've discussed the areas in which eye injuries can occur, the different types of eye protection available, and what to do if an eye injury happens. Common sense in taking the correct precautions can prevent eye injuries from happening to you. Wear your safety glasses.
don't take chances like these people did. The gift of sight, it's worth keeping. Safety must always be practiced as we proceed through the daily tasks in the machine shop. When we keep safety on our minds as we work on machines, we will not only protect ourselves and others around us, but also the machines we work on. Safety must always be a continuing concern in the machine shop. After viewing this videotape, you should be able to identify precautions that protect you from injury, identify precautions that protect your co-workers from injury, and identify precautions that ensure efficient operation of the machine shop and the equipment in it. A very important general rule is that regular cleaning of the shop will eliminate many safety hazards. Every shop should be cleaned at least daily or at the end of every shift. All operators must take responsibility for cleaning their own work areas rather than leaving the job for someone else. After sweeping, store brooms and dust pans in their designated area. Soiled rags should be kept in an airtight, combustion-preventing container that is emptied regularly. The machine shop should be checked for safety regularly. Storage areas should be clean and orderly with materials stored in their proper place. Oil and other combustibles should be stored in an approved cabinet with self-closing doors. This periodic safety check should ensure that all electrical equipment, such as wiring, fuse boxes, and outlets are free of hazard. A safety check should be made for the proper type of fire extinguishers and their placement. Fire extinguishers must be hung properly and inspected regularly by qualified personnel. Each fire extinguisher should have a card showing when it was inspected. If you use a fire extinguisher, make sure it is replaced with a fully charged unit. Everyone in the shop should know the basics of first aid and be able to care for cuts and abrasions. To treat a cut, apply a compress immediately and summon medical help. If injured persons appear to be in shock, lay them down and keep them warm. Every shop should have a fire blanket that can be used in this way as well as for smothering fires. When someone is injured in the shop, the injured person and the supervisor should fill out accident reports and send them through appropriate medical and management channels. This practice provides a written record that can be used to identify causes of accidents. All shop personnel should be required to attend regular safety meetings so that they can stay safety conscious. As in any other line of work, your greatest asset is your ability to think. An unthinking operator makes a bad machinist and an unsafe worker. It may sound obvious, but to work safely, you have to think about safety. Thinking safety means being properly equipped. Your shop should have signs to remind people of the importance of eye protection and wearing approved protective equipment. In the shop, you should always wear approved safety glasses. If you are working around flying particles, your glasses must have side shields. 
If you don't have side shields, wear a face shield. When safety glasses are not available, wear approved safety goggles. Some shops will have an eye wash fountain to wash out eyes if oil or caustics that are used on machines get into the eyes. You must also protect your eyes from welding flash. When welding is performed in the shop, shield the area to protect people's eyes in other parts of the shop. Thinking safety means wearing apparel suited to the job. Never wear rings, wristwatches, or other jewelry in the shop. Never wear loose clothing that can get caught in the machinery. If your hair is long, secure it so that it cannot fall into a machine. Roll your sleeves above the elbow to keep them out of the way of moving parts. It is advisable to wear safety shoes in the machine shop. Never wear soft shoes or open-toed sandals. This kind of footwear exposes you to injury from falling objects and from razor-sharp chips. For welding or heat treating, wear protective clothing and appropriate safety equipment. Thinking safe means using good judgment in the shop. Keep your hands away from chips. They are not only sharp, they may also be hot. It is not a good shop practice to use air hoses for cleaning machines. They may blow particles into machines and cause excessive wear. If you are using an air hose, be sure it is equipped with an OSHA approved air nozzle restricting pressure to 30 PSI or less. If you have to lift something in the shop, keep your back straight, your knees bent, and lift with the legs. If the load is of excessive weight, get help from someone else or use a hoist. Horseplay and practical jokes have no place in the machine shop. These activities can cause accidents and sometimes in industry are basis for dismissal. Thinking safety means using the tools of your trade safely. Always use a handle over the tang of a file. Be sure wrenches fit the object to be tightened. A loose fitting wrench can slip, injuring you and rounding the corners of the object. On the bandsaw, always adjust the saw guide to slightly above the work. Hold small work pieces in a work holding device and feed them into the blade with a pusher block. Keep proper working space around the machine, about four feet in front and three in back. And don't start the machine without having all guards in place. Remove burrs from work cut on the bandsaw with a file because they can cut you. On the drill press, never drill work held by hand. Use a vise or clamp the work to the table or base. Keep the floor around the machine clear of chips and oil. Never lubricate the machine or adjust it while it is running. Keep gloves and rags away from the drill press and remove chips with a brush. Safe operation of an engine lathe means using a wooden cradle block in changing chucks. Never leaving a chuck wrench in the chuck. Using slower spindle RPMs with out of balance or oversized work pieces. Never grabbing the chuck to stop the machine. Checking for clearance of setups before turning on the lathe. Using pliers to remove chips. And using only the proper feed and speed. To safely operate a milling machine, Never leave tools or materials on the work table. They can fall off and cause injury. The machine should be turned off when you are cleaning arbor holes for inserting adapters into the spindle. Always make setups away from the cutter and then bring the work to the cutter after it has been secured to a work holding device on the table. To safely operate automatic machines, such as turret lathes, Check all the operations step by step before using the automatic mode. Grind chip breakers into the tools so that they do not produce one long continuous chip. 
On grinding machines, safe operation requires testing the grinding wheels for cracks before you use them, keeping guards in place at all times, making sure workpieces are properly mounted before you start a cylindrical grinder, checking magnetic chucks to be sure the magnet is on and the workpiece is securely fastened to the table before starting a surface grinder, and being careful not to jam the work when picking up a cut, which could break the grinding wheel. When it is necessary to leave a grinding machine or any machine for a period of time, make sure the machine is turned off. To review, you should now be thinking machine shop safety to protect yourself, the people around you, and the equipment in the shop. Remember, safety must always be a continuing concern in the machine shop. This videotape will show you some of the many operations which can be performed on the drill press. These operations are center drilling, straight drilling, counter boring, counter sinking, reaming, and tapping. After viewing this videotape, you should be able to write down the safety procedures you should follow in the shop while operating the drill press, explain how and where the various drill press operations are performed, and explain the setup procedures that go along with each of the operations. Whenever you are working around machines with moving parts, you need to be extremely careful, both for your own welfare as well as for the welfare of others around you. Always wear your safety glasses. Remove all rings and jewelry. Keep sleeves above the elbows. Use a brush to remove chips from drilling operations. Since all operations performed on the drill press create a lot of twist or torque, it is important that the workpiece be clamped securely for both personal safety and precision. Some of the work holding devices you may use on the drill press are the straight vise, the angle vise, or clamping work directly to the table of the drill press. You should never attempt to hold any workpiece by hand while performing any drilling operation on the drill press. In this demonstration, you are going to go through the procedure of drilling a one quarter inch hole into a piece of plain carbon 1020 steel. For any drilling operation, the speed of rotation of the cutting tool and the rate that it is fed into the workpiece are the two most important considerations. You can find the correct drilling speed for any size drill and for any type of material by referring to the machinery's handbook. However, you may also arrive at a close enough approximation by using the simplified formula of RPM is equal to cutting foot speed times four divided by the diameter of the drill. Some inexperienced machinists have a tendency to use too low an RPM when using small drills. When you refer to the machinery's handbook, you will find the cutting foot speed for plain carbon 1020 steel using a high speed drill is 100. Using the simplified formula, 100 times four divided by 250 thousands equals 1600 RPMs. By going directly to a chart, you can see that for a cutting foot speed of 100 and a drill diameter of one quarter inch, the RPMs on the drill should be 1528. For RPMs of this value, a variation of plus or minus 100 RPMs is acceptable. To determine the feed rate, you can again refer to the machinery's handbook. 
the general rule for drills of one eighth inch to one quarter inch in diameter is two to four thousandths per revolution. For drills of one quarter inch to one half inch in diameter, the feed rate is four to seven thousandths per revolution. So for this demonstration, you can use a feed rate of four thousandths of an inch per revolution for the one quarter inch drill. The next important step is setting up the proper work holding device to secure the workpiece for drilling. You will use a straight or standard machinist vise to hold the work and clamp the vise to the table with T-slot bolts. You can use the center drill directly to locate the center of the hole to be drilled. But if you want more accuracy, you should use a wiggler set to locate the hole center. Place the wiggler in the drill chuck and make it run true. Position it over the center of the hole and line it up with a prick punch mark on the workpiece by moving the table and the vise. Lock the table in position and check the bolts holding the vise for tightness. The spindle should be extended far enough towards the work so that it can be pulled up to replace the wiggler with a center drill in the drill chuck. Turn on the machine and center drill the hole. When you center drill with a combination countersink and center drill before drilling the hole, this prevents the drill from traveling and missing the true center of the hole. When you have completed the center drilling, shut off the machine. Remove the center drill and replace it with a one quarter inch diameter drill. In this operation, since the size of the center drill is close enough to the diameter of the one quarter inch drill, you will not have to change the RPM setting on the machine. When you are drilling large diameter holes, you will have to make RPM calculations for the center drill and then decrease the RPM for the drilling operation. With the one quarter inch drill securely tightened in the drill chuck, be sure to remove the chuck key and then turn on the machine. You can bring the drill down by hand to the workpiece to drill the hole, or you may use the power feed at a setting of four thousandths of an inch per revolution, as determined in the machinery's handbook. Power drilling will sometimes give a smoother finish to the inner surface of a hole than you could obtain by hand drilling. During the drilling operation, you should add a few drops of cutting oil or lubricant on the drill. This gives a better finish on the inner surface of the drilled hole. Having completed the drilling operation, you can now perform another drilling operation, namely counter boring without changing the setup. In counter boring, you are enlarging the hole to a proper depth with square shoulders on the bottom to accept a socket head screw. Counter bores are equipped with guides or pilots to keep the counter bore centered in the hole. You should always add a drop of oil on the pilot to prevent it from binding in the hole. You will have to decrease the spindle speed for counter boring. Again, you can find the speed in the machinery's handbook or calculate it using the diameter of the counter bore. Another operation you can perform on the drill press after you have drilled a hole is countersinking. This operation cuts a chamfer in the hole to allow the head of a flathead machine screw to be flush with the surface. Countersinks are available with different chamfer angles ranging from 60 degrees to 120 degrees. Reset the spindle speed of the drill press for the countersinking operation to the setting shown in the machinery's handbook or use the rule of thumb which is one half the drilling speed. Reaming is another operation that you could perform in a drilled hole using the drill press. Reaming produces holes that are very accurate and have smooth finishes. To produce a well reamed hole, you need to allow enough material to be removed so that the reamer cuts rather than polishes the hole. Properly secure a machine reamer in the drill chuck and adjust the spindle speed to about two-thirds of the drilling speed for that size hole. You should use a power feed whenever available 
or as fast a feed as possible, which will give a smooth finish and accurate hole size. Keep the hole well lubricated with cutting oil and always remove the reamer from the hole before stopping the machine. You can perform tapping operations by hand on the drill press after you have drilled a hole to the proper tap size. Tap drill sizes can be found in the machinery's handbook. Secure a center in the drill chuck and use it to hold the tap in a vertical position. As you apply a slight pressure on the feed handle of the drill press to hold the tap vertical, feed the tap into the hole by turning the tap wrench with the other hand. To start the tapping of holes that go through the workpiece, you should use a taper tap. If you are tapping a hole that does not go all the way through the work, then begin with a taper tap and finish up with a plug tap and bottoming tap. Keep the tap well lubricated during the tapping operation and keep reversing the tap to break the chips in the hole. So far, all the operations you have seen have been performed on relatively small diameters. Let's look at a drilling operation of a large diameter hole. To drill large holes of one half inch in diameter or greater, you would use a radial arm drill. Holes of this diameter are frequently drilled in large castings. When drilling large holes in a casting, it is not necessary to go through the center drilling procedure as pilot holes are usually provided. You can clamp the workpiece directly onto the drill table and align the drill on the part to be drilled. You will still have to determine the correct RPM and feed rate for the size hole and material you are drilling. If there is no pilot hole in the workpiece, then you will have to center drill and proceed with step drilling until you have reached the desired diameter hole. Let's review what you've seen on this videotape. You saw the safety procedures you should follow in the machine shop while performing certain operations on the drill press. And you were shown the procedures to follow in performing center drilling, straight drilling, counter boring, counter sinking, reaming, and tapping on the drill press. Drilling and other operations performed on the drill press are basic to the machine industry. Knowledge and skill in the use of the drill press are important to all machinists. between training video producers and you, our valued customers, is not. Members of the Training Media Association are committed to producing quality training programs which benefit your organization. To continue meeting this commitment, we need your cooperation in respecting and protecting the copyright laws pertaining to this program. This means you cannot copy this tape. Not an extra copy to keep on hand. Not a copy for the boss to take home not a copy for the branch office, not a copy for the company archives. You cannot transmit this program over open or closed circuit television or satellite systems without permission of the producer. You cannot charge an admission fee or use this tape in an advertised seminar without permission of the producer. You cannot loan or rent it to anyone outside your organization without permission of the producer. You can contact the producer or distributor for special uses of this video.
create the world we live in and tell the story of our way of life. They have the power to move mountains, build roads and bridges, erect and destroy skyscrapers. They feed us, care for us, make our lives more enjoyable, and communicate our thoughts to our loved ones. Our hands are the tools that reach out and connect us with the rest of the world. They aren't accident proof, they aren't covered by any warranty, and without them, much of our life's activities would disappear. Because our hands play such an important role in our lives, do so many different tasks, we need to protect them at all times. But according to the National Safety Council, one out of every four accidents on the job involve hands, fingers, wrists, or arms. This study, completed by the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics on work-related hand injuries and upper extremity amputations, showed the largest percentage of injuries occurred to people who were operating, maintaining, or repairing machinery or equipment. But injuries also occurred in chemicals and materials handling, shipping and receiving, assembly, and office tasks, anywhere our hands are used on the job. While on the job, our hands are inches away from smashing steel, grinding wheels, saw blades, extreme temperatures, molten metal, sharp knives, pinch points, strong acids, alkalides and toxic chemicals, and repetitive motion stress. These computer reports from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's accident investigation files represent some of the ways that people incur hand, finger, and arm injuries. And in this program, we'll show you some of the work environments where these accidents occur, how they happen, but more importantly, what safety practices you need to observe in avoiding similar hand, finger, and arm injuries. Our work environment determines to a large degree the hazards we encounter. For instance, your job could contain environmental hazards, such as extreme heat or cold, electrical energy, rough materials, or your job might have ergonomic hazards, such as repetitive motion. Many jobs deal with chemicals and irritating substances or biological agents. Other jobs contain mechanical hazards, such as sharp edges, points, crushing actions, rotating shafts, in-running nips, and pinch points. We can protect ourselves from all these hazards by following the company's safe work procedures, understanding when hand protection is required, and choosing and wearing the correct personal protective equipment. Because in almost all incidents, hand and finger accidents occur as a result of our personal behavior or our lack of understanding about safety. November 7th, 1992. John Growler is assisting in bending heavy metal plates to a predetermined arc. Although instructed to keep the floor clear of obstacles around the machine, he waited until it was in operation before doing so. Tripping over his own tools caused him to fall into the rollers. The machine operator was completing paperwork and wasn't aware of the accident until it was too late. Housekeeping is not just about being neat. It's about preventing accidents. John Growler never connected hand injuries and housekeeping. Now he does. For some hazards, there are no gloves that will protect you, only your belief in your personal safety. On October 10th, 1991, Earl Osterman, changing the cooling liquid on a drilling machine, scratches the back of his hand with a drill bit. Deciding to finish the job before getting first aid attention, he then allows coolant to flow into the wound. The coolant had been contaminated with bacteria, and by delaying going to the first aid station, he allowed his hand to become infected. When deciding which glove to use, the most important consideration is the work being done and what hazards are present. Earl Osterman didn't wear gloves or understand that the use of coolant was hazardous you must understand the hazards you're faced with and choose hand protection accordingly. And if you're not sure, check the MSDS or ask your supervisor. Because when working with chemicals, you should be aware of their ability to deteriorate the glove material, flow through a seam or pinhole, or the chemical diffuses through the glove and can't be seen with the naked eye. Over time, this can cause serious toxic effects to skin, respiratory, or the central nervous system. Therefore, inspect your gloves for these conditions before using them each time. 
other safety precautions to observe are avoid contaminating the inside of the glove with dirty hands and keep the outside as clean as possible. Only use them for the job they were designed for. Don't reuse disposable gloves and replace any gloves that are dried, cracked, or misshapen. Store reusable gloves in a clean, dry area. Extreme temperatures also present hazards to our hands. Monique Salvar, in June of 1992, failed to wear enough insulation under her protective glove. After several hours on the line, she lost control of her hand muscles and suffered a serious cut. Working several hours at a stretch may require you to layer the protection by using adequate insulation inside gloves and a chemical or oil-resistant outer glove. Some people require more protection than others. Under these conditions, be sure the outer glove is large enough to accommodate the insulating liner. Repetitive stress is another hazard that we need to be aware of. Repetitive stress develops over time and can be caused by allowing your wrist to work in awkward positions. Keeping your wrist in line with your arm and changing your hand motion may relieve much of the discomfort. To help prevent damage to the skin on your hands and fingers,